you know, we thank all of you for being here this morning, especially on a low turnout day. It helps to have everyone over here. We're, we've got a couple of visitors from out of town this morning. We're glad to have you here this morning. Uh, we were visiting with them this morning about the nature of our church services here and the difference in a lot of churches. We, we believe that the apostles followed a very simple worship service. We have singing uh, without musical instruments. Uh, we all love musical instruments. I'm the big a fan of musical instruments as we have, but we don't believe they belong in the church service. He told us to sing with melody in our hearts and tune our hearts and sing directly to him. And, and I don't, I don't, some of us don't think we have a very good voice, but you've got the voice that God gave you, and that's the one he wants you to sing with. So we have a simple service of singing, and we call on someone. Brother Dwayne didn't know I was going to call on him this morning to offer prayer. He gave a prayer, a good prayer from the heart. And then when we, the ministers, those of us get up and speak, uh, we don't speak from a script. Sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. We believe that what the Lord places on our hearts, we try to study and come up with a general subject, and then we depend on the prayers of the congregation and the help of the Lord to guide us in instructing. I, I, don't, I know all, most of you here, uh, I don't know what's on your heart, but the Lord certainly does, and he knows how to deliver a message to you regardless of who or, or how who the speaker is or how good the speaker is. You know, on the day of Pentecost, he allowed the Apostle Peter and the other apostles to preach in at least 17 different languages that they didn't know, but they preached and everybody heard it in their own language, and we believe that's still true today. I can say something, and it may hit three people, different people, different ways, that whatever they've got maybe on their mind or trouble on them, the Lord can deliver that message. So, again, my prayer is that the Lord will bless you either through me or in spite of me. He'll give you the message that he knows each of you need today. Uh, I have a pretty short, simple subject on my mind. All of you knows that I love history and I love the Old Testament history. I'm primarily in the New Testament today, but I have a, I like to explore the Bible. I like to find the interesting things in it. And I have a subject that I've not heard preached on. It's a pretty short subject, so... We may be short, we may get out here early, earlier than we think, but of course, you know me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Baptist preacher and I'm also an attorney, so when I tell you I may be short, that doesn't necessarily always work out like that. So y'all be with me, but we'll, we'll certainly get you out of here on time, but maybe even a little bit early today. I'm in the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 17. If you have a Bible, and there's some pew Bibles there in the pews if you don't have one. I'm in the 17th chapter of Matthew. And I, I have a one of the of Jesus's miracles. It's probably one of the the recording of it is probably one of the shortest miracles in the Bible, <coughs> and it's uh, one that I have not heard spoken on, and so it, that, that kind of intrigued me itself. And we don't believe there's anything in the Bible that's not worthy of of studying and and speaking about and understanding, because everything in there has some sort of message to deliver. It's in the 17th chapter of Matthew. There's four verses beginning with the 24th verse through the end of that chapter, which is the 27th verse, 24th, 5th, 6th, and 27th. It's pretty short. It's pretty simple. Uh, in the 17th chapter of Matthew, if you back up one, just to put it in context of where this is, in the 16th chapter of Matthew is when Jesus asked Peter to, ex to explain who he was. Uh, getting a little bit of feedback, but just I don't know why. Uh, Jesus asked uh, Peter to explain who he was, and, and he said, well, a lot of people think you're John about this, a lot of people think you're Elijah. He said, but who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So just a chapter before this, we have an explanation of who Jesus is. He's the Son of the living God, the true Christ. And after that, then, on, in, in uh, chapter 17, Jesus takes... Uh, three of his uh, apostles, Peter, James, and John, up to the top of the mountain, which most of us believe was Mount Tabor. It's up close to the Sea of Galilee. He takes him up in the mountain, and that's where the transfiguration, He get, the, the apostles get to see Jesus in his glory when he came shining white. And he also gets to see Moses and Elijah standing there with him, which, uh, you know, that, that and, and they talk to him and discuss his pending uh, demise where he will die on the cross. Discuss that with him. So you have uh, Moses and Elijah, both of whom clearly died a long time ago, several hundred years ago, 
yet they're having a discussion with him, and that goes to the basis of our doctrine, is that we don't die uh, when our bodies die, but we are our soul immediately goes to heaven, and we'll be over there until the Lord uh, puts back together our bodies and our souls into a perfect body. <coughs> so that helps support that doctrine. And after that, it says at the end of chapter 16, it says, Then they came down from the mountain, and they met a multitude, and they ran into a man who had a, a son who was possessed. He fell into the water and fell into the fire, and nobody could heal him. And so Jesus plays over him and removes the demons from him. And his gen- his, uh, d- all his disciples that were traveling with him says, Well, we tried helping the man, and we couldn't help him. And Jesus said, Well, it takes prayer, but it also takes fasting. There's the approval of fasting. Jesus said, Sometimes if you've got a problem that is so severe, not only should you pray about it, but you should also fast. You should fast to the Lord. And again, we're to, we're left on our own as to determine what kind of fast we have. Uh, but generally, I recommend a fast that eliminates animal products, all, all meats uh, of any kind, meats, fish, chicken, fowl, and uh, any uh, like milk, cheese, all those are animal products. Eliminate those so you go with vegetables, fruits, nuts, uh, maybe a little bread. You should take care of whatever your dietary needs are if you have to take medicine you should take whatever food is necessary to support that but then uh, basically you can fashion a diet around water i like to eliminate caffeine drinks but water fruits nuts and vegetables uh, and then and, and do it and you're not to let anybody know you're doing it you're to fast and keep it quiet to yourself but it i found it to be very helpful when i do it of course i've said the devil doesn't want you to fast he doesn't want you to honor god and honor the lord and so it seems like every time I get ready to fast, one of my idiot partners brings Krispy Kreme donuts to work. So the devil knows uh, us, and, and so you be aware of that. He knows your weaknesses better than you do. Anyway, that's where they are. He cures this lunatic, and then his disciples and him, the disciples are still with him. They're up near the Sea of Galilee, and they're traveling. That's where we pick up in the 24th verse of Matthew 17. Let's just read these four verses. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that receive tribute money, these are tax collectors, is who this is. That's who he's talking about. When they got to Capernaum, some tax collectors came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? Does your master pay taxes? Verse 25, And Peter said, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, interrupted him, before Peter could tell him what was going on outside. He said, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of earth take custom or tribute? From whom do the kings take taxes when they're paying them? He said, do they take it from their own children or from strangers? And that means their own own sons, their own children, or strangers means non-family members is what that means. He said, they're here to collect taxes. And, Jesus, and, he, and, he, and Peter jumps right off and says, yes, my master pays taxes. And when Peter comes inside, Jesus Before Peter can tell him, Jesus already knows what he's going to ask. And he says, Peter, what are you thinking? He said, from whom do the kings take taxes? From who who pays taxes? Do they take it from their own children? Do they take it from strangers? And Peter answered him and said, of strangers. And he take it from other people other than his family. And Jesus said to him, then are the children free. He said by that word, that's the King James Version. He said, then the children are free. Jesus makes this declaration. So we know Jesus, of course, being the son of God and being the king of kings himself, both son of God and a king, uh, should he be paying taxes is what he's saying. Verse 27 is where the miracle comes in. The miracle is one verse long, uh, and it's it's probably one of the shortest uh, recitations of a miracle in the Bible. So the <coughs> what the uh, what is owed here is uh, the, the, this tax, and so Jesus says, "But I don't want to cause trouble. I don't. You know, he's basically saying I don't think I should have to pay that tax. But notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, we don't want to offend them. <coughs> Go thou to the sea. Remember, they were right next to the Galilee Sea. Go to the sea, cast a hook." Now, Peter always fished with nets. Every time in the Bible we have, he uses nets. He doesn't use a fishing cane or a pole and a hook. But anyway, Jesus tells him to take a hook, 
Take the fish that first comes up, the first fish that comes through the water and catches the hook. Take him, and when you open his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take it and give it unto them for me and thee. So we have the story here of where this is called the fish with a coin in its mouth. And Jesus says, no, you know, I, I, don't, I shouldn't have to pay taxes, but <coughs> we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to cause any trouble, so we'll pay. He said, go out to the water to the Sea of Galilee, just uh, real close by. Put a hook in the water. A first fish that grabs a hold of it and comes up, take that fish off, open his mouth. In there you'll find a coin that's enough money to pay taxes for the two of us. Now, what we have here on display easily is Jesus' powers. He has his power of omniscience. That means he's all-knowing. And his omnipotence, his all-powerful uh, one. He has both of those powers to do. Uh, you know, you can go read Psalms 8 and 8, and it says that he, he has power over all dominions, all the animals, all the fish in the sea. You know, he, he has complete authority over all of that, so he has all the control. But when Peter comes in the house and says, fix to tell him, Jesus interrupts him and says, I already know what's going on, I already know what you're going to tell me. This is his omniscient powers. He is all-knowing at any one time. Now, the reason this is important is, you know, sometimes we get we have troubles, and we'll think, well, you know, Jesus doesn't really know what's going on with me. Nobody knows what's going on with me. I'm kind of keeping it to myself. I'm having troubles. I've got medical troubles. I've got all these troubles with my kids and my family with my work. Jesus knows everything. If you've got troubles, he knows about it before you even tell him about it. And that's what Peter's about to do, and he, he's proven he is omniscient. He knows everything <coughs> all the time. Now, that's beyond my capabilities to understand, how someone can know all of that and know every one of us, every person in the world. But it says he knows every bird in the air. He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every fish in the sea. So he knows what's going on. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm going to make this up a little bit. Obviously, he knows what's going on in the fact that he knows that, you know, fish are always picking up stuff. You, you know, fishermen will tell you, you cut open a fish, you find all sorts of stuff in its belly. Uh, a lot of commentators would say this is the first miracle in the Bible that involved a fish. Well, I think a guy named Jonah may disagree with that. There was another big fish that Jonah ran into. <coughs> it was involved a miracle, clearly. <coughs> saving Jonah's life, throwing him up. But here we have a fish, and fish is, uh, go across the, the ocean floor, the sea floor, and pick up stuff all the time, put it in their mouth. You know, they have all sorts of fishing stories about everything they find. Fish are known to pick up shiny objects, too. So Jesus knows, if, uh, and I'm speculating on this, what happened. Jesus knows that a fish picked up the exact amount of money that was needed in this case and swallowed it, and then he has the omnipotent power to direct that fish to the top of the water to take Peter's hook and, and, and to come up with that amount of money. So we have a real display of Jesus' powers and the miracle he, he performed with those powers to pay the exact amount of money that was required. Now, that's the simpleness of the story, and that's the way most people live it. Most people see it. Most of the commentators talk about it. So our sermon could end right here as far as most people go. If you look at Christ's miracles, that's the shortest one told. In fact, there's rarely any commentary with it. He just he produced a fish with a coin in his mouth to pay the taxes. I think there's more to this story, though, than what we have here in this short thing. I don't find anything in the Bible that does is not in there without purpose, without merit. So let's back up and let's kind of look at this again. Go back to the 24th verse where we started. When they got, he and his disciples were traveling together. His disciples, when they were come to Capernaum, and Capernaum is a city on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. If you remember, uh, Peter, as well as Andrew and John and James were all fishermen. They're all experienced fishermen. And this is where the, everything started back when Jesus got them and recruited them as apostles and told them he would make them fishers of men. They're all on the Sea of Galilee. That's where he preached a sermon on the mount. That's where he uh, went out and, and calmed the waters. That's where he walked on the sea, walked on water. So this is a common area for Christ to be with his disciples. When they were come to Capernaum, now if you go back to, uh, I'm going to try to think about it, Matthew 8 and 14, I believe, we find that Peter, if you go back and look, it says Peter owns a house in Capernaum. 
because that's where they probably are. They're in a house, Peter's, uh, Peter's house. That's where we feel like the disciples are staying. Peter owns a house with his wife. Uh, he was married. That's back in, in Capernaum, too, back in that eighth uh, chapter of Matthew. When they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money, the tax collector. Tribute money, this is taxes. But this is not the same kind of taxes that you and I think of. You know, <coughs> over there when uh, in the uh, 22nd chapter of, of Matthew, when Jesus is being questioned, and I've spoken on this before, questioned by the Sadducees and the Herodians, and they ask him, do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And that's when he, his, his famous quote, yes, you render unto Caesar things that are Caesar's, render unto God the things that are God. Yes, you do pay your taxes, but you also render thanks to God. This is not civil taxes he's talking about. This tribute money is a church tax. It's actually a temple tax. And if you go back and study the Greek on this, the underlying Greek, this is talking about a tax in the church. <coughs> it's a tax for the support originally of the tabernacle and uh, of the church. So it's, it's not talking about taxes, civil taxes that we normally pay. Now over here, when Jesus is talking about it here in a minute, he says, of whom do the kings of the earth pay, uh, receive taxes from? That taxes is a civil tax, the same one that he talks about on render unto Caesar. <coughs> but this is not a civil tax. This is a church tax, a temple tax. And you've got to go back in the Old Testament. You all know I love this part. You go back in the Old Testament to figure out where this started. You go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 30. In Exodus, chapter 30, beginning at verse 11, Moses, uh, the Lord was giving instruction to Moses. This is in the time when he was telling him how to build the tabernacle. How you take it and you build it with two rooms in it, the, uh, the most holy, the holy room and the most holy room, and you have the, uh, where they go to worship. And he says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, says, when you take the sum of the children of Israel, when you take a census of them, after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord, when thou numberest them, and there'll be no plague. He, one time you give a ransom for the soul, you pay. Each man has to pay. And they that give shall give every one that passes among them that number uh, that are numbered a half a shekel. A half a shekel is the same thing that he's asking for over here. Half a shekel at that time was two drachmas. Drachmas was the coin that they used. They had one coin that represented two drachmas that equaled a half a shekel. That was what they asked to be paid for a ten it was a tabernacle tax. And he says, Every one that passes among them that are numbered from twenty years old and above, they shall give an offering to the Lord. Then he makes this statement, the Lord does to Moses. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. It's a flat tax, what we call a flat tax. Everybody pays the same. Doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor. Now, we know Jesus, when it comes time to, for our righteousness and our heavenly things, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, we're all the same. You don't buy your way into heaven, you don't, you don't, you, your failure to pay doesn't keep you out of heaven. So he says, the rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, and it's to make an atonement for your souls. In the last verse 16 of, of Exodus 30, And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and they shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord, to make an atonement for your souls. Now, this was repeated again in Second Chronicles 24 and 6, and also in Nehemiah 10th chapter when they were rebuilding the temple. They had this, what was called temple tax, it was originally a tabernacle tax, and it was a temple tax. It looked at from, the, from the appearance of the Old Testament, it appeared to be a one-time tax. But of course, you know, once you start providing tax money, it's hard to cut taxes off. They keep collecting on forever. That hadn't changed. It started back then, still today. You give somebody a tax, has taxing authority, give them the ability to tax, they keep it up. We do, once we introduce a tax, it seems like we never do away with it. So that's what this one was. It was apparently a one-time tax what the Lord intended, but man has kept it up. But it was to be a temple tax. It was to be taxed to every man that was age 20 or older. Rich didn't pay more. The poor didn't pay less. It was a flat rate tax to everybody. Now again, this is symbolic of, of, of your, it says when it's a ransom for your soul, that sounds like it has eternal consequences. It says it's a ransom for your soul. It's to be redeemed for your soul. It's an atonement for your soul. For your sins, Part of it is you had to pay, pay this 
temple tax, tabernacle tax, or temple tax, as they call it now. That's the tribute that's being collected over here. And everybody's supposed to pay it. It's for the support of the church. It didn't go to Caesar. It didn't go to the Roman authorities. Now, uh, and I learned later on that after this is over, up in 1670 A.D., uh, Caesar, especially Titus, started collecting even the temple tax from people as well as the Roman tax. And he, he confiscated all of it and used it, and then that's when it, it went away uh, at that time. But it, it, the Romans did find out that the Jews were taxing themselves this tax and took it away from them and later on after Christ died. But here it says, uh, they came to Peter and says, Now, does your master, does your master pay tribute? Does he pay this temple tax? Well, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a civil tax or income tax. We're talking about a tax to support the church. Today, we don't tax the church. We ask you know, people voluntarily give to, to the support of the church. At that time, they had a temple tax. And that's what we're taxed talking about. So you go back, have to go back to Exodus. It was repeated in Second Chronicles and again in Nehemiah. And they said, this, uh, uh, but it's, it's not a civil, it's a church tax or a, 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 a tribute for supporting the church. And Peter said to them without thinking, yes. And when he was coming, he said, yes, sure he does. He says, when he came in the house, Jesus, before he could talk, Jesus interrupted him and said, Peter, what are you thinking? <coughs> he said, who has to pay taxes to the king? Does the king charge his own family tax? Does the king pay taxes? Do we charge the king with the king's own tax? The king, that would be taken out of his left pocket and put in his right. But we don't charge kings taxes, and, and, and neither do we charge the king's family, the children. <coughs> what he's saying is, I'm the king. I, you know, I'm now the king of this temple. This is not a civil tax. This is a church tax. Now, I'm the king, and you know that, Peter, and yet you just automatically assumed and said, uh, yes, he would. He would do that. My master will pay that tax. He said, I shouldn't be, basically saying, I shouldn't be charged that tax. This is my house, and uh, I'm in charge of it, so I shouldn't have to be paying that tax. <coughs> He's trying to give Peter a lesson here, and I believe what we have going on here is what Jesus did many times. He uses a physical example to teach us a spiritual lesson. Said, he's the king. He is the king. He doesn't pay taxes. That's what he's saying. He said, Peter, of whom do the kings of the earth take customs or tribute? Who, from whom do they take taxes? From, do they take it of their own children or of strangers? Strangers means not their children outside the family. And Peter says, well, of strangers. And Jesus said to him, then the children are free. We, we should not be having to pay these taxes. Then he goes on and says, but I'm not going to cause trouble, but we'll pay. So he says, here's what I want you to do. Go down there and, and catch this fish and bring it up. And the amount the fish brings up, the word that it's using is, in his mouth you shall find a piece of money. A piece of money, if you go back to the underlying Greek, it was a slater. A slater was a piece of silver. It was a coin at that time used, a piece of silver. It was equal to four drachmas, twice the amount of money that was used for, in this case, uh, for, for the uh, one person to pay the taxes. It was the exact amount of money to pay two people's taxes, exactly to the two. Christ said, "Go now, go pay it for you, and for me. Pay it for both of us." Now, one of the first things that I'm, I think of here when I see this is, Christ said He would pay the taxes, even though I shouldn't be paying them. He should pay the tax. I'm going to pay the taxes. We're going to pay them for me and for you so we don't cause them trouble. Why didn't he pay it for the rest of the disciples that were there? <coughs> Why didn't nobody, you know, the, all the disciples were traveling with him. Why didn't they have to pay it? Well, I, I think it, 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 this is my speculation, it, but it just talks about him, Peter. But all the other disciples were there too. <coughs> but he only paid the taxes for him, Peter. Now, who has to pay the tax? All men of age 20 and older. This should lend credence to the fact that the disciples were, all those apostles were, were early at that time, were under 20 years of age. I believe there's a lot of credence in the Bible for that. All the, all the people at that time, they didn't have the, the formal schools. 
and retired home. You got to be 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. You went to work. My dad put me to work. I was still in grade school, and I was doing full-time printing by the time I was 14, 15. Back in the older days, it would go even further back than that. A lot of people were married by the time they were 15, 16 years old. I believe, you know, we get this picture in our minds that all the apostles were old men. Every time you see pictures and drawings of them, they draw them with beards and old men and hunched over. And clearly they were. Remember, after Christ died, when he was about 30 years old, and <coughs> that was about uh, 30 A.D., we know it was 70 A.D. before Jerusalem was destroyed and the apostles were still all preaching. That's what the book of Acts is about. So there was 40 more years that the apostles preached. So they were 60 and 70 years old at the time most of them died. We know Peter and Paul both died at about 65. They were beheaded. Some of the other apostles went up into to Russia. That some of them, I mean, some of them went down into uh, Africa. Some of them went up into Europe. Andrew went up into Europe and preached. So they preached for 30 and 40 more years. So they really were pretty young when they started out. So this makes sense. Just one of those little indicators that uh, why didn't he pay it to them? It doesn't make any sense because he paid it for Peter. But Peter was a little older. That's why he was the leader of the apostles. He was the oldest one among them. <coughs> and he was married and he paid taxes. Excuse me. That's a side note. And that's gospel by Richard. It doesn't have, we're never told how old the apostles are. But I like to look at this and I'm going, you know, we all assume that they were old men. <coughs> they were old men when they started. They were all fishermen. They all worked hard. That's who you hired to do the work, though, was the 18, 19, 20-year-olds. You know, you worked that hard in fishing and down at the dock. By the time you got 40, 45, you were pretty well worn out. Your bodies were pretty well worn out. You can see that today. So I think that's one of the things that we learn. <coughs> Excuse me. From that is that I, I gleaned out of this. It, it kind of caught me off guard. I went, well, the rest of them didn't pay it because they weren't required to pay it. They were all under 20 years of age. Now that's by me. That's not in Scripture, except Peter and Christ are the only one that, that were required to pay it because they were um, of age, over the age of 20. But now, what was this tax for? It was a tax for a ransom to the soul. And that's what the Lord told Moses. That sounds pretty serious to me. You need to pay your taxes and give your soul a ransom. <coughs> no, sounds like you probably have to buy your way into heaven. This is under the old law. And under the old law, you were required to do work. You know, that was what you do. You had to work. You had to make sacrifices to get your sin. And you had to be sure you had to sacrifice all the time to get your sins removed. You had to take a sacrificial animal to the priest and make sacrifice to you. And you had to do it every year, repeat it every year. That was a requirement. You did have to do some work to keep yourself righteous in the eyes of the Lord. But if you go back here to the book of Psalms, verse 49, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 49, I apologize for my voice. Uh, chapter 49, uh, beginning of verse 6 and 7. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. <coughs> wealth not going to get you into heaven. That's one reason this was a flat tax. It's the same for everybody to get to heaven. Money's not going to get you there. Righteousness is what gets you to heaven. But none of you with your money can buy your way to heaven. You can't give your way to heaven. You can't give enough to the church. You can't do enough good. You can't, you know, it's good. That's why we believe that this is part of where we believe there are two salvations taught in the Bible. One's an eternal salvation, and that's where he gives us eternal life, and he took care of that before the foundation of the world. Your name is in the Lamb's book of life. It's there, and he won't come out. Now, secondly, most of the Bible is about timely salvation, where if you do the things the Lord's instructed us to, he gives you salvation today and tomorrow. He takes care of you today and tomorrow while you're living in this world. That's the largest part of salvation that we have. But here he's telling us, this is talking about eternal salvation, where David says, those that trust in their wealth and boast themselves the most of the riches, you know, the concept is that rich people think they can buy anything, you know, and that's 
Uh, that we, we know that's generally true in the world today. Not Nothing wrong with having money as long as you don't worship it and you don't love your money. You can do a lot of good with it today and tomorrow. And that good will help you now. It's not going to help you get eternal life. You've already got that. But it can help you, uh, your life, and make your life better, make your family better. There's certain things you can do if you do it wisely. Don't spend it. Don't spend it for uh, thinking you can do it. Don't spend it for evil things or, or sinful things. But spend it in a manner that will be helpful to the Lord and to his children. Spend. But he says, David says, but none of that's going to get you to heaven. None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give God a ransom for him. Then we have some people that think they can buy uh, their mother or their father or their brother or sister or child into heaven, or perhaps they can get them baptized even after death and get them into heaven. Well, you can't get a rate, you can't give a, nobody can do that. You get everybody's on their own. Uh, everybody can't, can't, nobody can do it for anybody else. Everybody's just kind of search on their own, but we know we're not on our own. We'd never get there. I'm going to go over to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Jesus talking. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. Jesus said, I didn't come down here for you to minister to me, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Christ says that we can't pay a ransom for our eternal salvation, but Christ is our ransom for that. Nothing we could do. It's not of works that we get ourselves into heaven, but because he laid his life on the line, he paid the ransom himself completely. Now, compare that back to where we are. <coughs> he said, number one, Peter, uh, we don't pay taxes. I don't pay the taxes because I'm the king. And guess what? The children also are free. But what he's telling us is to get into the king's house, heaven, to get into that, he doesn't have to pay because he is the king and he's the son of the king. Guess what? You don't either because you're his children. If you're a child of God, you get in free also. So back under the Old Testament day, it was considered a ransom. Jesus came under the law to take care of that. If there was a ransom, he paid it himself. He didn't need to pay it <coughs> to get himself there, but he paid it for us. He's our ransom. When he laid his life down, he, he paid that ransom. He paid that price. He's like we'd have to pay the tribute today and like he paid it for Peter. He paid it for Peter back in this timely fashion. He paid it, but it has great, uh, it's a, like a, a shadow, we call it, a type and a shadow of our eternal salvation that we have to pay. Jesus, uh, they were asking him to pay the temple tax, <coughs> and yet, uh, back in Matthew 12, verse 6, uh, Jesus was in the temple, and he was looking at it, and he says, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Jesus was greater than the temple itself. <coughs> That's why he didn't have to pay taxes. It was his house. He owned it, and he didn't have to pay it in a, in a, in a sense like that. And so he can invite whoever he wants to, including his children, into that house. That's what he does with heaven. He invites the people he wants, and they don't have to pay to get in. They, they, they come because he pays that for you. He represents that ransom for you, whatever payment you would have to make. He pays it for you. He didn't. Peter didn't have to pay it at that time, and, and uh, neither do we have to pay it, uh, being children of God. I'm going to conclude with this, finish a little bit because of my voice and because I don't want to over-talk this. I'm going to finish with 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, you can't be redeemed by money. You can't be redeemed anything value. You were not redeemed with silver and gold, corrupted things, silver and gold, and from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers. If you're going back and reading the Old Testament law and all those traditions passed down, none of that's going to help you either. Nothing is going to help you under the old law. Nothing's going to help you today in money in redeeming yourself, uh, uh, paying, paying for your way to into heaven. But it's with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you.
You can't be redeemed by money. You can't be redeemed by the old law that your forefathers taught you about. But you are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He's redeemed us. You don't pay the ransom. You don't have to pay the tribute money to get the, the tax they were talking about. It was a physical, timely thing that Jesus used here to teach a point of eternal salvation. We serve a wonderful Lord who uh, paid our debt. He paid it uh, because for all of you whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the beginning of the world. But in time here, he left us a great uh, purpose about we do make our about what the payments that made can have timely benefit here. He gave us a good lesson here about sometimes we don't cause trouble. We're not going to be troublemakers in this world. I don't have to pay this tax in the world, but to avoid trouble, <coughs> to not be a stumbling block, to not offend anybody, we'll go ahead and do it. There's times, you know, when we have government imposes authority over us, and we may be subject to that authority, and we may say, we don't like this, but we don't want to look like troublemakers. You start doing that, and people start putting the wrong, setting, casting wrong doubts on you. You know, they would have made Christ look bad here if he hadn't have paid the tax. Well, to avoid that and for the greater good, he said, sometimes we'll bow to authority even though they're wrong. And that's the same way you find us. So there's several lessons in this short little four verse here. I would encourage you to uh, study that. Uh, it, it, it's not very long. It's not very hard to understand. It's the shortest miracle. And none of the commentators I find have much to say about it, but I found it had a great deal to say once you get into it and study it. I appreciate your kind attention and my prayer is that the Lord will richly bless each of you.